We're going to get started tonight. We're going to do a little study. Uh, Wednesday night we will start, I believe, in 2 Corinthians, and we will pick that study up from 1 Corinthians uh, starting Wednesday night. I hope you've enjoyed 1 Corinthians, but we're going to give you a couple of studies here of something different. And uh, we started this study in the 5 o'clock Gifted and Talented class, and it, it started from a conversation I had with Traven this morning, and I've never taught it where it's recorded, so I want to teach it. We were talking about what makes us believe in the rapture being a, tree, a pre-trib rapture. In other words, what makes us believe that the rapture of the church or the snatching away or the taking away of the bride of Christ will happen before the tribulation. So we've got to set some ground rules here. There is no seven-year tribulation in the Bible. But there is a seven-year period, Daniel's 70th week, which is one seven-year period or a week of years. The Jews have weeks of days, that's seven days like we have. They have weeks of months, that's seven months. And they have weeks of years. So sometimes they speak in weeks, they mean sevens. So there is a period in Daniel called the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, which is set aside from the other 63 weeks, and that we believe that is yet to happen. So it's very clear in the Bible, after the taking away of the bride or the church or the body, whichever analogy you want to use, then God turns his face back to Israel centered. Now there's still a scarce amount of Gentiles that are saved in this time, but they're not really even hardly mentioned. From chapter 4 in the book of Revelation on, there is never a mention of the church. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, it's all about the church, church, churches, churches, churches. And then Chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 1, it says, And there was a door open in heaven, and a voice said, Come up hither. And most theologians think that's a reference to the come up hither, snatching away of the church. I don't know if it is or not, but I know this. Uh, for the next 15 chapters, there's no mention of any church or body of Christ or bride of Christ. The next mention of that group of people is in chapter 19 of Revelation. There's a window open and Jesus comes out with a riding on his uh, white horse coming back to earth to fight the battle of Armageddon. And the Bible says, with all the saints riding on horses with him. So if you can put two and two together, this is what I'm trying to say. There is no one verse, chapter and verse, that says, the rapture will take place before the tribulation. There's not. But there could be a hundred that allude to it. And what we're going to do tonight is look at one area that I believe speaks to me that looks like to me the church is gone in this period. Now let me say this. I believe this with all my heart. Ricky, Dr. Ricky... So I both even lost one of her favorite horses, been her horse forever. Matter of fact, I think there was a little toss up between her true love, this horse Jet or Dr. TC, I don't know. So Dr. TC may have, you know, had some hand in the horse's demise, I'm not sure. But I tried to write her a note on Facebook and let her know just what I believe. You know the Bible says, that all of creation groans for the redemption of mankind when God makes everything new. You see the animals and the planet, they were cursed because of no guilt on their own. They were cursed because of mankind. And I believe God puts spirits in those animals. If they have spirits, I don't believe they have souls but I believe there's spirit 
They, if you've spent any time around animals, they have a spirit in them. They're not just bodies flopping around. They have personalities. They have spirits. If you mess with them at all, there's something in there looking out at you. And of course, if it's a dog, there's this adoration and this unconditional love looking out of those eyes at you. And if it's a devilish cat, there's this disdain for you looking out at you. Always. So I told her, I said, I think you'll see your horse again. I'm not trying to be goofy. I think it would be very presumptuous of us to believe that God would have in his creation a whole group of beautiful animals that never did exist again because of our sin. And I told her, I said, listen, you're going to come back one day riding on a horse, and it'd be just like God to let you ride on your jet. I believe that. I believe all those animals are going to live again. I believe every dead fish, every dead bird. Now, do I have a verse, chapter and verse? No. But I got about 100 verses that allude to it. Do you know what the Bible says about itself? Hey, it says, here's wisdom. You want to figure out how to uh, learn from the Bible? Well, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little bit, there a little bit. You get an ideal over here. You get an ideal over there. Why does God do that? God does that for the seeker. The hidden and deep things of God are hidden and deep. They're not laying on the ground for some idiot just to stumble across them. God does not throw pearls to swine. So let's look at my thesis here, okay? So Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Let's go real fast. We'll recap what we just learned in there. We'll try to do it really fast. I'm all that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Okay? Now, what we're under is Paul's gospel that he received in the desert from Jesus Christ himself. Peter didn't get it. James didn't get it. And it was hard for them to understand. Peter says, the things that Paul teach are hard for me to understand, but I believe they're scripture. So they were, it was given exclusively to Paul, and Paul makes some bold claims about it, which is not another. He said, this ain't, it ain't really another gospel. It's a falsehood. It's a, it's a heresy. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. It's perverted bad today, people. It's perverted but, through, but though we, that means him and who's ever in his entourage, we are an angel from heaven. You need to remember that, underline it in your Bible. And when I get to this other verse, write that verse by it. He said, it does not matter. Even if I come back later and I've lost my mind and I'm crazy as a drunken bed bug and I try to tell you another gospel, don't believe me. How many of you guys used to watch uh, the Pink Panther movies? I'm not talking about the cartoon. I'm talking about, what was his name? Yeah, but it's Sellers. Was his last name something? Sellers something? Peter Sellers. Clouseau, yeah. I used to love it because he had that little oriental uh, cook and, bo you know, house boy. And they always had this thing. It was the Oriental houseboy's job to keep his, what was his name, Inspector Clouseau, Pink Panther, to keep his martial arts skills sharp by rigging up traps for him and tricking him and jumping out of the dark and stuff. Well, Dr. Uh, in, Investigator Clouseau, Clouse, Clouse, what is it? Clouseau would be tired. He might have just got blowed up in a, a car or something, you know, and he, he's coming home, and the little oriental guy, because he had been told, I don't care. 
if I beg you to stop or if I threaten to fire you or kill you, you have to keep my, you know, martial arts skills sharp. And so he's come back from being blowed up and his hair's all, he's, and out jumps the little oriental guy and he's like, no, please not tonight. And he's like, no, no. That's what Paul's saying. If I come back later and I try to tell you something different, don't believe me. Or he's going to be real exaggerated. Even if an angel comes. See, we don't think about angels interfering in, in our daily walk, but it was a common thing for them. This ain't in my notes, but I'm going to chase this rabbit. There are things that hang in my theological crawl. One of them that has hung in my crawl for 35, 40 years is the story of the man, the crippled man, at the pool of Bethesda. Now, there's five pools, and they're called the pool of Bethesda. And they were pools, and they had coverings over them. And the sick people were brought there and put under the covering so they didn't bake in the sunlight. So there's five of them. Now, for scores and decades and decades, um, anthropologists had undercovered or discovered three pools of Bethesda. And they started running their mouth. And they said, the Bible's wrong like usual. There wasn't five, there was three. And they poo-pooed the Bible for decades. Now, guess what? They found two more, and there is five. But the story goes like this. So, at the time of the feast, when it's a pilgrimage must come to Jerusalem, where there are millions of people in town, they're just packed in there like cordwood. At the time of the feast, you would take your crippled and sick and lame people and put them by the pool of Bethesda. So Jesus goes and he steps over all of these sick people. Some of them probably even had COVID. I mean, they were really sick. I talked to a principal in a school in this area today. She said for the last three years, all through the flu season for the last three years, they've been uh, at the point of over 20% of their teachers and students out for the flu. And some schools have closed and they've considered to close and should have closed probably several times. Because if you get 20% or more of your students or your students and your faculty sick with the flu, you can close. She asked me, she said, do you know how many cases of the flu that we've had this year? And we're over half through the year. I said, I don't know. She said, guess. I said, I, I don't know. She said, well, guess, stupid. I said, I don't want to guess. She said, why won't you guess? I said, why won't you tell me? She said, zero. So the story is, Jesus steps over all these sick folk, and he gets this one guy who's been laying there for 38 years, and he says, are you ever going to be made whole? And the crippled guy looks up like, that's a dumb question. Who are you? He says, oh, yeah, easy for you to say. I don't have anybody to put me in the water when the angel comes and stirs the pool. Jesus said, roll up your bed, get up, and get out of here. And no, I've never heard a preacher preach on it. Was there an angel that come once a year and stirred the pool? Because the guy says, you got to be the first one in when the angel stirs the water. I've looked. I cannot find it in a historical writing anywhere. Wouldn't there be a Jewish historical writing of the occurrence of an angel from heaven that come once a year during the feast time and people were flocked to this pool trying to be the first one in? It's just mentioned in the story and nobody even considers it. 
Let me ask you this. What kind of angel is that? A demon. All of these sick people around there, and he stirs the water, and whoever... If I'm the crippled guy, that's just how I think. I'm like, lay me on the very edge. And then when I see that, I'll just do the old belly roll. But no, people aren't like that. They'd rather blame somebody else. I don't have anybody to put poor old wool poor as me. But there's no commentary written on it. I've looked. Is this a historical fact? And does it sound like God that would stir the water and just heal one person and then another person that's crippled is trying to get in there and say, man, sorry, you're second. And you know what second is? Second's the first loser. That's the things that keep me up at night. So he said, but we are an angel from heaven. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be a curse. Let me ask you something. Did they have a history of angels coming and preaching to them? Was that a widely known phenomenon? Can you think of, before this was written, times when angels came? The word angel means messenger. That's what they're for. Can you think of episodes where angels came to earth, manifested into earthly bodies, and brought a message? When you go home, you'll think of hundreds of them. So he says, if an angel, or they come back later, preach a different gospel, let God curse them. So look at 1 Corinthians 15. We've got to figure out what the gospel is. And this is the gospel for this age. It's called the church age. It's called the age of grace. It's a different age than any other time. The gospel, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And Noah preached a gospel. But it wasn't this gospel. He didn't preach that Jesus was died, buried, and resurrected. He preached the good news was that God's going to provide you a cruise ship if you'll just get on. He preached for 120 years without one convert. Kind of reminds me of me this morning. 150 people, not one person needed prayer. But you just got to keep preaching. But you'll think, if you want to spend the time to do it, you can think of hundreds of occurrences in the Old Testament and through the Gospels. Now remember, just because Mark, or Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John are in technically what we call the New Testament, they're not part of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the Old Testament until the death of Jesus Christ. So you only got one chapter, sometimes a half a chapter. They are not the New Testament. The Bible says that the Testament's not in force until the death of the testator. So Roy, you need to make sure you stay in good with daddy and mama because you don't get you don't get the inheritance till they die. Get it? So the testament's not enforced till the death of the testator. So what is the gospel in this age? First Corinthians chapter 15, remember? That's where we just came out of. It's the clearest definition of it. Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. It's the power of God, the salvation, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Can a person believe in vain? We went all through that. You sure can. Can you believe on Jesus Christ and split hell wide open? You sure can. I just figured out why this church is empty tonight. Super Bowl. What the hell are we doing here? This is Super Bowl night. Sorry, I let you all down. It's Super Bowl night and it's an ice storm. 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Where did he receive it? In the desert with Jesus. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's the first part. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Those are Old Testament scriptures that prophesied the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel for this age. That's what a person has to hear and believe in in order to be born again. So 1 Corinthians 12, look at this. We're moving right along. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, this is an analogy about a body. We ought to know about a body. We all got one. Some of us got way more body than we should have. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. This is in theology called the doctrine of one body. See also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized, are submerged, are placed, are covered, are put into this one body analogy of a body okay the spirit does the work whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free or have been all made to drink into one spirit so it's not the baptism uh, in the holy spirit you hear that all the time that that is never in print Never, not one time in your Bible. There is no such thing as a baptism in the Holy Spirit. The phrase is baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit where he baptizes you, the believer in Christ. Another phrase is the baptism of with the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit is the baptizer. You are the baptizee. You have to get it straight. And there's seven baptisms. There's only one that counts. And that's when the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, baptizes you into the body. Christ. So, did we get through 13? Yeah, for, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, or, and, have all been, and, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So it's one body. There is no such thing as a, a Jewish Christian or a, a, a Gentile Christian. You're both Christians. You're new creatures. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's three categories of people on the earth. Jews, Gentiles, and Christians. There's Jews, Gentiles, and born-again new creation believers. Okay? That's what Paul teaches. He teaches it everywhere. So look at Romans 2, 28 and 29. Look what he said to the Romans. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is, he, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. It profits you nothing, he said in another place. 29. But he is a Jew. This whole section of scripture, he's talking about the covenant that the Jews had with God. And he's saying, that's, that's not how to get a covenant now with God. By an outward physical circumcision. It's a spiritual circumcision. So watch this. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter or the law whose praise is not of men but of God. So he's making this point and he makes it several places. Look at Revelation 7, 4 through 8. Now I want to show you something. Remember my premise. I believe the church is taken out before the seven year period of Jacob's trouble. This is how I'm going to prove it. Okay? And I heard the number of them which were sealed and were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. What does it mean for God to seal you? The Bible says that when you're born again, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. 
There's no way you can be unsealed. These 144,000 young Jewish virgin male evangelists are sealed by the Holy Spirit. But I want to show you something. Of the tribe of Judah were 12,000. And I, won't, and I won't go through them all, but he, he wants to make his point so clear. He said there's 144,000 of these in another place. He says they're young Jewish virgin men that evangelize the world. That he goes through each tribe just so you don't miss it. Those are not Gentile people. Those 144,000 are Jewish young men. And he goes through this three verses to prove it. So look at verse 6. Of the tribe of Asher, we're still 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali, verse 7, he goes through all 12 of them. Verse 8, on and on and on. Do you get it? It's Jewish tribes. So look at verse 9. Now, remember, this is in the seven-year period called Jacob's Trouble. Now, I hope you will see with me, here's a whole other category of people that believe. Okay? After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands. That's Gentile nations. Gentile speaking. Gentile people. There's two categories here. But Paul said there's neither Gentile nor Jew in the body. But I'm putting forth the thesis. The body's gone. These are saints. They're saints all through the tribulation period. Through the book of Revelation. But they're always distinctly determined by Gentiles and Jews. That is not true in the Pauline epistles. Matter of fact, when we went through and taught you 1 Corinthians, I went back and taught you in Acts that this church was started and built and greatly built with Jews. You know why? Because nobody ever teaches that. Because in the book of Corinthians, it don't make any distinction. But in the book of Acts, which God took me years and years ago and showed me, they started out of the synagogue. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, but in Revelation, there is distinct God, the Holy Spirit goes out of his way to make the distinction. Look at Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Look what Paul says to the church at Galatia. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. That's the same thing he told the Romans. But that's not true in the book of Revelation in the seven-year period called Jacob's trouble. Look at Revelation 12, 17. 12, 17. And the dragon, we know the dragon, Satan. Okay? And the dragon was wroth with the woman. We know the woman is Israel. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The remnant is Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. There's just going to be a few of them. There's just a remnant. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's not your salvation. We talked about it in the 5 o'clock class. Why do people keep commandments? For their salvation. But we don't. But there's a group of people in this verse. They have the testimony of Jesus. Yes, they do. But they keep the commandments. That is not the church age of grace. Look at 14.12. Revelation 14.12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's not your salvation. Now, if you get trapped in some of these cults like Garner Ted Armstrong, don't you get it? These are the verses they use to try to get you to believe you've got to keep the commandments. And they hate Paul. Matter of fact, most of them don't believe Paul 
uh, epistles should be even be in the Bible. So you got to watch these fringe cultic Seven Day Adventists, <laughs> Ellen White, Armstrong Boys. You know what they preach? They preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's a different gospel. And I'm not. I'm just reading it. Paul said, let God put them in hell. That's what accursed means. So, here the patience of the saints. They are saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, look at, uh, if you want to know who they are, look in this same chapter, 11 verses before, Revelation 14 verse 1. At the start of this chapter, it'll tell you who he's talking about. Who's he talking about? And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood in the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. That's the 144,000 that he talked about in chapter 12, right? Young Jewish uh, male virgin evangelist having his father's name written in their foreheads. That's their seal. So who's keeping the commandments? These 144 Jewish young men. So look at Revelation chapter 15. Let's look at this verse, and then we'll be caught up to where we was a while ago. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Remember who the beast is? That's the Antichrist system you find in chapter 13. So these groups of uh, believers have gotten the victory over the beast and over his image. Remember, the Antichrist, he has, he has a name, he has a mark, and he has an image. Look what they've overcame. They've overcame his image, overcame his mark, and, uh, and overcame the number of his name. And they stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Well, that's not you. We don't sing no song of Moses. Did you know the Bible in the Old Testament has the song of Moses? But we don't sing it. We care less about Moses. I like reading about him. He's a great guy. But to the Jews, he's it. But not to me. It's Jesus Christ. But these people, they sing the song of Moses. That's not white crackers from Oshalana. You've got to be smart enough to figure this out. So what in the world would we be doing singing the song of Moses, keeping the commandments? I'm not under the law. Look at John 1.17. John 1.17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We're in the dispensation of grace. Now that don't mean we get by with sin. Listen, my friend, you don't get by with anything. You will reap what you sow. But never in the creation history of mankind was there a group of people that God birthed their spirit to life till the day of Pentecost. And that group of people are used by many analogies. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church, the day of grace, the times of the Gentiles. Nobody before the day of Pentecost had a spirit birth. So to say that this isn't a unique time, listen, the law came, was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Look at Galatians 3.13. This is us. This is the letter to the church at Galatia. We're the church at Matoka. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. I don't have to keep no commandments. I couldn't keep them on my best day. Being made a curse for us. He took the curse. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I'm not keeping no commandments to be right with God. We're redeemed from the law. I'm not singing no goofy song to Moses. Go to Revelation 14. Let's look at 6 and 7. Now, remember, remember the first verse. Paul said, if we are an angel from heaven. So, let's see. Here we go. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This angel is going to come and preach the everlasting gospel to the Gentile nations. Now what do you think the everlasting gospel is? It's not the gospel of Paul. It's not the gospel that Jesus died and was buried and was resurrected. It's the gospel of eternity. It's the good news of eternity. It's the good news, because eternity is right around the corner, right? It's the, ever, it's the good news of an everlasting covenant. But it's not the same gospel that Paul said, if an angel comes from heaven preaching you a different gospel, let God curse him. Well, this angel ain't cursed by God. He's sent by God. So how do you rectify that? How do you rightly divide that? He's in a different dispensation. He's in a different age. There's been a gospel in every dispensation. What was the gospel that Adam preached to his two sons? Now listen, you got to rectify this. When Cain bashes his brother in the head with a rock, there's cities everywhere. There's people everywhere. Cain says, oh no, they're going to hunt me down and kill me. Who's going to hunt him down and kill him? All the people on the earth. He says, my punishment is too much to bear. And God said, all you had to do was go sacrifice a lamb, like I told you, and I'd have forgave you for bashing your brother's brains in. He says, sin lieth at your door. What is sin? Sin, the lamb becomes sin. He said, it ain't hard for you. You're just too stubborn. And every other year on this day, the 14th of Nisan, every other year of your life, you've swallowed your pride. You've put beside your defiant disorder that's what they claim kids have today. What's it called? Uh, defiant disorder syndrome. Oppositional defiant disorder. It's shortened at my house into what I call lab. And that stood for lack of beating. Because you can beat that out of them most of the time. Now, if you have a kid that actually has some problems, maybe chemical imbalance, things like that, that's right. But nine times out of ten, uh, they don't have a disorder. They got a behavioral problem. So God tells Cain every other year on the 14th of Nisan, on the day that become Passover, that represented the day that I killed a lamb and covered your mom and daddy, you brought a lamb. But this year, you just said a little frisky. You just wasn't going to do it. You just had your little defiant, uh, what do you call it? Opposition defiant disorder acting up. And you didn't have your medicine. So you killed your brother. But he said, hey, there's a lamb right over there by your house. Sin lieth at your door. 
It ain't out of reach for you, Cain. You're just going to have to wrestle yourself and come to the point that you admit that you can't do it. And then you're going to have to comply with what I told you to do, as silly as it sounds to you, and go over there. There is a lamb, sin. There's, there's sin. It's lying at your door. Go get that lamb. Sacrifice it. And your sins will be forgiven. He wouldn't do it. But what was the gospel Adam preached to his two boys? Listen. God has established this. Every year on this day to commemorate when God slew an animal and covered me and your mother. He wants us to, to slay an animal. And its blood is going to be innocent and it's going to cover us so do that and you'll be saved and Abel done it every year and Cain come up to a year and said I'm not doing it and the Bible tells you in the New Testament he was of his father the devil now I said this last week in Sunday school and I had five people say well, I never thought about it like that <laughs> You guys would be terrified if the devil came in here right now, walked in here, and destroyed my life. But if Traven did it for the devil, you'd look down on Traven. Well, what difference would it make? If the devil comes in here and destroys my life, or if Traven does it, my life is destroyed. And what people don't get, and I deal with them all week long, their lives are destroyed and their life is full of pain because of, A, the sin that they've committed themselves, or B, the sin that someone else committed to them. And the outcome's the same. They're just doing the devil's work. So what was the gospel? That was the gospel Adam preached. What was the gospel Noah preached? God's going to provide a boat. What was the gospel Abraham preached? What was, there's many gospels. But this is not the gospel of Paul. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. You know what that speaks of? The creation. The everlasting gospel has a piece of it declaring God is the creator of all. And what's been attacked in America and around the world is evolution has attacked this belief that God is the creator. But the everlasting gospel... Let's go back. We've got 15 minutes. Let's read these two scriptures together, and you'll get the whole gist of it, I hope. So six, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. There's a comma there. There's not a period. What is he preaching? What is he saying? Verse 7, saying... With a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and the water. There's no mention of death, burial, and resurrection. It's a different gospel. Why? Because it's a different dispensation. It's a different age. The church is gone. <coughs> Look at Matthew 24, 13. What does Jesus say in Matthew 24, 13? Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to Jews. Every one of them is Jews. And he's talking about Jerusalem at the end of the tribulation. He's not talking about Oshalata. He doesn't even mention Okisa. <laughs> okay? These are Jews. And this is the time of the end. They ask him, what's going to be the end of this age? I know your Bible says world, but it means this age. And he gives them the 
story in plain, but it ain't to you. It's to Jerusalem and Israel. So he says this, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Is that you? No, but 90% of preachers in churches tell you you have to endure to the end. You can get right up to the end, and if you slip or, you know, if you turn your back on Christ, then you don't make it. You're not going to be saved because you didn't endure to the end. And Jesus said, you have to endure to the end to be saved. He didn't say that to you. He said that to a group of people in a different dispensation, in a different land far, far away. It's very clear in this time, you may have to die for your faith. Listen, you got all these Christians today. I would die for my faith. Shut up. You won't even come to Sunday school. Don't tell me how you're going to die for him. You don't come back on Wednesday night. Don't tell me how you would lay your life down for him. You're home watching the Super Bowl. An organization that promotes racism, pedophilia, anti-America, and most of the people that go to church on Sunday night are either having a Super Bowl service in their God-forsaken church, or they stayed at home to watch them. You know what one of the greatest coaches, he coached at OU, one of the greatest coaches said back in the, probably the 30s, 40s, probably late 30s, they asked him, they said, what do you think about today's game? He said, I think there's 22 men on that field that are in desperate need of arrest. And there's 80,000 in the stands that are in desperate need of exercise. And just walked off. <laughs> One of the greatest coaches ever did. He put it in perspective, didn't he? It's a stupid game. And now, it, it's crazy. But anyway, I do digress. So, that's not to you. You don't have to endure anything. Endure to the ends the gospel of the kingdom. That's what's preached by all of these people on TV, by most of them. Do you know why they preach the gospel of the kingdom? We talked about this in 5 o'clock. Because if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, then you need to be a financial part of it. And you need to send in your tithes and offerings so that they can build the kingdom of God. But when you find out what they're building, they're building their kingdom. Paula White said she wanted everybody to send her their January gross paycheck. And I can show you the video. She said, if you don't, you will not be prosperous. You will not be blessed. And on and on and on. Why do people follow that trash? So you have to rightly divide the word of God. So let's look. We're not looking for the tribulation, but we do study it so that we might help someone. The Bible says to encourage each other in these things. So let's look at what Paul said in the last letter, in the last paragraph that he wrote before he died, 2 Timothy 4, 8. This is what he was looking for. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He knew he was fixing to die. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So let me leave you with this. We're not looking, trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. We got our eye on a couple of people. We're not dreading going through the tribulation. I hope we don't have to. It's bad enough now. Gas is over two dollars. Thank you, Joe Biden. But we're looking for his appearing. Every day, some days more than others. I just beg him. I told him the other day, a couple of days in the week, I said, 
hey, okay, let's negotiate this, okay? Now you came and you took Enoch by himself, and you left everybody else. I said, why don't you just do that again? Just take me out of here. You can leave everybody else. I'll just negotiate with you. And he said from heaven, no. Of course he didn't. I'm just making a joke. But I'm still here. But that's what we're looking for. His appearing. His coming to get us. And you know, one time I had a guy I was arguing with on this idea. And he said, he said, you're just a chicken. You don't want to go through the tribulation. Now he did. He wanted to be a martyr. And I told him one day, I said, and a lot of these guys here know him. I said, if you don't get to be a martyr for Jesus, you're going to get all bummed out, aren't you? Now I'm going to take some of them with me. I said, that's not the heart of Christ. He said, well, you're just a chicken, and you don't want to go through the tribulation. I said, bark, 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 bark. I don't have nothing to prove. I'd go right now. So look at what he says here. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not just for me only, but for everybody that's looking for him. There's a crown for looking for him. So keep your eyes up. Look for him. Don't get your head down and looking around and get bogged down in all the things in the world and the political mess and this is going to go bad and there's... Let me say this. I got 10 minutes, but I'm going to let you out early. Last week, I about had a wreck. I've been politically following this for 30 years. I could not tell you how many hundreds of times I've heard this exact same radio announcement. This is what they announced. The United States government has a decision to make because it's a matter of days, weeks at most, before Iran has nuclear capability. I've heard that for 30 years. We're going to have to go bomb them. We're going to have to save Israel because Iran, in two months, I've heard, six months, Two months, four months, two weeks. Yesterday. Yesterday. It's all a big theater. I just about died laughing. I was like, oh, the big bad Iranians. They got, we got three days till they kill us all. That's a joke. Listen, don't worry about the Iranians. Don't get uh, bent out of shape because of the Pakistanians. Don't worry about those in Syria. You just look for him. Okay? Amen. And... Uh, Keep the gospel in this age, the gospel. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these dear people that came out in this blizzard of 2021. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.